Joe, just give me the old next slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, is it Joe? Okay. It's one click away from the chat button. <laughs> right. Houston, we have a problem. All right, hello everyone. Let's get started. Thank you for joining today's Studio Special Fellows webinar. I'm Xiaowen Wang from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm serving as the director of the CyberDS Center for Advanced Digital and Spatial Studies at UIUC that organizes this Studio Special Fellows webinar series in partnership with AAG, UCGIS, OGC, and NORC at the University of Chicago. We would like to acknowledge the support by the National Science Foundation for the Geospatial Fellows Program. And personally, I would wanna give a shout out to uh, several colleagues, Dr. Colleen Doney, uh, Julaiti and Eileen uh, at AAG and Dr. Anand Padmanabhan and uh, Becky Vanderwally at UIUC CyberDS Center for their wonderful work on helping organize this webinar series. Now with my uh, great pleasure and honor, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We uh, have uh, Dr. Peter Kendron and uh, Dr. Joseph Kohler and myself will give this a final webinar of the Geospatial Fellows webinar series. Dr. Peter Kendron is an associate professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning and a core faculty member of the Spatial Analysis Research Center at uh, Arizona State University. His research focuses on understanding interacting processes created persistently on even spatial patterns developing new methods of spatial analysis and using those methods to address economic, social, and environmental problems. His most recent work is closely related to the topic of today's webinar, examines reproducibility and replicability in the geographical sciences. Dr. Joseph Holler is an assistant professor of geography at the Middlebury College. His research focuses empirically on social vulnerability adaptation to hazards and climate change and methodologically on modeling social vulnerability and processes of planning and implementing adaptation at individual and national scales. And most recently, his work is focusing on reproducibility and replicability of the geographical models of social vulnerability and attempting to validate them with the new indicators of harm derived from service or social new sources of uh, volunteer geographic information. Their topic today is uh, working with the students to produce COVID-19 research to establish the credibility of findings and accelerate policymaker adoption. After the talk by Dr. Kendron and Haller, I'll be giving a brief presentation about the CyberGIS capabilities from a reproducibility perspective. We'd like to hold all your questions toward our talks gonna be finished. At the same time, could you use our chat box and the Q&A box to uh, type in your questions and or ask for any clarifications and submit your comments. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass the floor to uh, Joanna Peter, take it away. Thanks, so, Joe, Peter, go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, can you all see the screen okay? Uh, it's not shared yet, no. Oh, didn't share, I can redo that, sorry. My fault, okay, and there it goes. Here we go, sorry everybody. Okay, great. So thank you Xiaowen for the introduction and thank you everyone involved in getting today's uh, webinar together. These things always take a bit of effort on the back end. So Joe and I greatly appreciate the effort that everyone put in and uh, thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today uh, to talk about some of our early results from a series of reproductions of COVID-19 research that Joe and I have been doing. Um, so really cut to the chase of the presentation, basically for about 12 months now, 
Joe and I have been trying to do reproductions and replications of geospatial research on COVID-19. And in this webinar today, we wanna to give you some insight to not only our findings from those reproductions, but also uh, some broader topics related to building infrastructure to facilitate uh, reproductions and, re and replications in the geographical sciences, and also some pedagogical elements that we've been trying to develop along the way as well. Um, and just, you know, I was looking at the list of attendees this morning, and I saw there were a lot of graduate students in the audience today. So I really want to encourage everyone to, you know, please do ask questions in that Q&A section or in the chat, because Joe and I are happy to talk about these things. And we're going to talk about a number of different studies in varied degrees of depth. So if you want more information about any particular thing we talk about, please feel free to go ahead and um, just ask a question there. We'll be sure to address it at the end. Um, so basically here, just really briefly before we dive into some of our findings and some of our, our work, just to give you some context on what we've been doing. Basically, um, Joe and I had support for this project through um, two different NSF uh, related projects. One is the larger Geospatial Software Institute of which Joe and I are COVID fellows um, for this year long project. And then recently, uh, back in, in June, Joe and I started a three year NSF project looking at reproductions and replications in the human environmental and geographical sciences, specifically trying to build some of the infrastructure we need to make this part of our standard normal pedagogy and our regular practices of research evaluation in the field, while also doing some reproductions of high impact uh, policy relevant research of which we hope some of these COVID reproductions are some. Uh, more broadly as well here, we've also really tried to uh, address a number of topics that we see as important in terms of uh, kind of quantitative spatial analysis uh, related to health here, but more broadly in, in general here. And that links into this work with the Geospatial Software Institute and the um, Cyber GIS uh, Research Center that Xiaowen uh, is leading. And we've really benefited immensely from working with not only the other COVID fellows, but also uh, the team there working with Cyber GIS um, X. And really a lot of our work directly links into that platform, which we'll talk about throughout this um, conversation today. And then finally, and probably most importantly in some ways, <laughs> uh, all this work would not have been possible without our students. So really, Joe and I took a very purposeful approach that all the work we've done on these reproductions and replications has been done with students, both graduate students and undergraduate students. And that includes the empirical reproductions themselves, but also some of the infrastructure building. So that's been done in class settings and in um, RA settings and independent studies. But it really is an integral and super important part of our work. And one that we want to kind of really emphasize as we go through this is there's this important pedagogical dimension to establishing these practices for the next generation of uh, researchers, right? If we don't kind of build the, build the stuff they need to do these things, they're not going to get very far in the long run. Um, so ultimately, that's kind of our broader context. But what are we doing here? Well, we tried to basically reproduce COVID research to try to assess its credibility. Um, you know, we were interested in COVID like much of the rest of the world because it's been shaping our lives for a year and a half. But you know, from in terms of a research context, this is particularly interesting. It's a novel disease, so we have some uh, understanding of its dynamics, uh, transmission dynamics, things like this. We don't have other levels of understanding of certain things. It's a dynamic and rapidly changing environment. There's this urgent policy need to understand this, this area uh, of this phenomenon in the world. And also we've kind of got this situation where there's fragile public trust uh, around the science of this issue. So, you know, it's particularly important in a sense to work in these kind of environments because it is policy relevant, it is impactful for society. I and mean, we need to know if the research we're producing is producing reliable, credible results. So our approach to this was to use reproductions to basically evaluate some of the research coming out in this area, particularly geospatial research, because that's where Joe and I probably have the most expertise uh, to speak with some level of intelligence about what was done and, and how we could potentially do things better. Um, and I think an important distinction that will come up as we go through our presentation today is we did focus on the question of, of reproducing the research, kind of getting the same results that were got the first time. But we've moved beyond that as well in these projects and tried to really uh, also assess the kind of the decisions that were made in that research project, different research projects, and how sensitive those results might be to some of those decisions and how well justified some of those decisions are. So really, again, trying to creep towards not just could we get the same results, but is the, are the results, uh, do they seem to be credible? Do they seem to be reliable? And so at the end of the day, our kind of animating question here is, is COVID-19 research credible? Uh, we start with this basic question of can we reproduce some of these studies 
but we quickly move on to what are the barriers to making those reproductions, what are the decisions that were made, and how do we improve the research practices that go along with this. Um, and so I'll just say our, our presentation maybe has a little bit of a different structure. Rather than kind of putting a bunch of theoretical things up front, we thought we'd just dive right into one of our reproduction examples that we think illustrates well many of the different elements that we've done, both in terms of working with CyberGISX, doing a reproduction, building infrastructure, having a pedagogical element to give you a sense of sort of how all this works. And then we'll back out after giving you that example and walk through our broader approach, how we've been building infrastructure and how we've been applying that infrastructure to a series of additional studies beyond just the one we highlight here in the beginning. So that's kind of our approach. Hopefully you guys will find it engaging and interesting. And um, the, the big thing here, I think, is to remember with all of this is kind of the animating question behind all of this is not only is COVID credible, but it's about building sort of the infrastructure for science in our field, right? So if we think of science as building these explanatory structures that tell stories, of, tell us stories about the world, the important thing is that we scrupulously test those stories to make sure they're reliable and credible. So we arrive at the most reliable way of thinking given our present level of knowledge. And that's true of COVID, but it's true of many other things we study as well. So the larger context of this particular COVID um, project, and I think the larger context of CyberGIS in many ways, is building the infrastructure to make sure we have these important evaluation mechanisms within our, our field of uh, geographical analysis more broadly. So with that said, I'll hand it to Joe, who's going to dive into our, our first example. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, Peter, for that eloquent introduction. Um, I'd like to essentially tell the story of the adventure of us trying to reproduce and uh, replicate uh, one of the first COVID studies we looked at, which was published by folks at Urbana-Champaign on the CyberGISX platform. And Peter, I think you can go to the next slide. And that study is a study of spatial accessibility in Illinois. Uh, the original study was published in September 2020, just about as our COVID-19 fellowship kicked off in the International Journal of Health Geographics. And this study is interesting because it also provides the analytical backend to a dynamic public health dashboard for Chicago and Illinois is called, um, or Illinois, sorry, <laughs> called Where COVID-19. Um, I'm in Vermont where you pronounce everything absolutely literally, uh, no matter what, how it's spelled. Um, so that came through. Um, so that a web address for the interact, interactive dashboard to inform public policy is there. And the main purpose of this study was to implement an enhanced two-step floating catchment method to measure the spatial accessibility to ICU beds and ventilators um, by both people who are over the age of 40, 50 um, and by folks who have already had a COVID case in Illinois. Um, so next. And so the great thing about this notebook um, is that parallel to the journal publication, the authors also published a Jupyter computational notebook um, using Python. So uh, if you go to CyberGISX, there's a one-click procedure for cloning and opening the notebook on CyberGISX platform. And what is that? Uh, CyberGISX is a CyberGIS uh, high-performance computing server and community uh, where people can share these computational notebooks. And the reason to use a computational notebook is that it's um, a huge asset for re re reproducibility because it interweaves narrative with text and outputs. So you can interweave all the components of a research study into one document, essentially, one executable document. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see an illustration of one little piece of that notebook uh, where you've got a narrative heading, you've got Python code for mapping hospitals, and then down below, you've got a slippy leaflet map of hospitals in the Chicago region that was uh, generated by that very code. Uh, next. And so uh, the work with this began with an undergraduate student doing a senior independent study. Um, Derek Burt completed this independent study in the fall of 2020 uh, by attempting to reproduce and replicate this uh, computational notebook. He succeeded in reproducing the results for Chicago and unfortunately failed to reproduce the results for the full state of Illinois. We found that in that computational environment, the file size and the re resources required to process the network graph for the entire state of Illinois um, were inadequate and the, the file size proved to be a barrier there. 
Um, so he ultimately changed tax to a replication and implemented the study for the state of Connecticut with town level COVID data. And you can see the results of that on the right uh, next. And so moving on, another independent study student took this on in January and tried to tack back to implement this for Illinois. Uh, so he set up a Python environment on his local computer, updated the OSM and X and Network X Python packages that are used to acquire OpenStreetMap data and create a network graph out of that data and analyze that graph. Uh, so with doing that, he was able to reproduce the Illinois uh, results. Um, and those new package versions also required revising some code. So uh, just like data is always changing, so are algorithms. And uh, your code often needs to be updated with new package versions as you're trying to reproduce work, um, unless you use the exact same packages that something was published with. Um, and so one minor contribution that we made during that January term, in addition to fully reproducing the study, was to replace an ego graph function with a subgraph function. And this improved performance by making a virtual subset of the network graph without generating a completely new copy of the network graph um, for one component of the analysis. Um, and so Kufre's code on the right shows that he saved more than half of the processing time with that one simple change. Uh, next. And so at this juncture, I hope you're starting to get a sense of the open science potential of cyber GISX and our work in reproducibility. Based on our feedback about Illinois, the original authors revised the notebook to focus on Chicago. Unfortunately, those revisions also inadvertently created some new bugs and conceptual problems with the notebook. Um, so as I started to teach this notebook in the spring semester, I revised some of that code and sent a pull request through GitHub back to the original authors, which they then accepted, repairing the functionality of the notebook for Chicago. Meanwhile, 17 Middlebury students forked to the repository and cloned it to their own cyber GISX accounts, reviewed the methodology, executed the notebook, and published reports with ideas for improvements and some uh, implementations of those improvements on their own GitHub accounts. So all of this, Collaboration is facilitated by GitHub, where the history of all of the changes of various authors are recorded, and forks of the repository to all the different users and students are, are also there. And so the changes are shown on the left there, and all of the different users who've been forking and reproducing this notebook are on the right. Uh, next. And so then this summer, I rehired Derek Burke, Derek, Derek Burt as a research assistant, and he reanalyzed the notebook. And we started making a litany of improvements for the reproducibility and efficiency of the notebook. So I'll kind of quickly go through some of those. Um, first of all, he applied our HEGSRR template, which we'll get to introduce to you in a, in a few minutes. Um, he applied that template to the research notebook and organized all of its content using that template. He used the USGS metadata wizard to document metadata for all of the inputs up to uh, open standards for metadata documentation. Um, and he revised the research methodology. So some of the improvements we made were code to increase reproducibility of data by downloading and pre-processing pre as much as possible with code. Um, code to increase uh, the reproducibility of the figures by more closely replicating the figures in the original publication, including histograms and classified maps with the same aesthetics. We also added code to increase the credibility and legibility of this research by creating a vignette of the hospital catchment area methodology, which you see in the top left, um, the histogram and map are uh, right and bottom, and adding in checks for the input data, especially OpenStreetMap data, which is um, volunteer geographic information. So we found that it actually has quite unreliable speed limit data. And so we had to make some fixes to get the work, the code to work with changes that users had made to the OpenStreetMap database in between the publication of the article and our replication last summer. Um, we also increased the efficiency of the computationally intensive processing by um, using the subgraph function I mentioned earlier and also reorganizing the data structures and algorithms a little bit to uh, run Dextra's algorithm for shortest path a third of the number of times that the original code had. Um, 
ultimately benchmarking yesterday and today, we saved about 80% of processing time uh, by making those changes, kind of bringing it down to a minute 30 to a minute, depending on the environment at the time, uh, from upwards of seven and a half minutes. And finally, we added code uh, to load results from the original notebook and quantitatively compare uh, our results with the original results, which you can see on the next slide. So in sum, we achieved successful computational reproduction with a Spearman's row of 0 0.97, which is seemed to be foiled only by a couple of hexagons along the lake shore, uh, which may have been excluded in the original study. Um, the CyberGISX platform provided a collaborative scholarly community of GI scientists and students to work on this. Um, and we have several ideas for future work if we continue to work on this notebook, including implementing new OSMNX and NetworkX functions to better pre-process the data, including better treatments of speed limit data. Um, improved construction of catchment area polygons. So uh, the convex hull methodology leaves something to be desired in terms of catchment uh, polygons, but better algorithms are not readily available in the network, um, network libraries in Python yet. Um, and a couple of other ideas to more fully implement the paper and uh, uh, improve computational efficiency on it. So with that, I'd like to pass it back to Peter. Thanks, Joe. Um, so we've dove kind of deep there for a second into the CS end uh, and the quantitative end of the discipline quite a bit. But uh, I think taking a step back from that, you'll see how that vignette is illustrative of a lot of the other work we've done as we move forward here. Um, and essentially, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we approached um, reproducibility and replicability. And, you know, in, in presenting what he just did, Joe used a number of terms that are sort of have specialized meetings that I want to sort of return to and place in this larger context of how we do different types of scientific studies for different purposes. So kind of more broadly here, um, Joe and I have found that our perspective on reproducibility and replicability actually is pretty well summarized by some work that was done by Christensen and some colleagues published about two years ago that really uh, separates the idea of when you do research and you think about reproduction replic replications about looking at two dimensions. Uh, one dimension being whether your data is the same or different, kind of on the vertical axis here, and then uh, going along the horizontal, whether you're repeating the same procedures, or whether you're sort of introducing key differences to the original study that you're doing. And in our case, we mostly focus here on the same data, same uh, procedures, but we did drift around this box a bit. And we think this is important to note as a distinction because uh, essentially here, you know, depending on what you're doing in terms of these combinations, you sort of have a different purpose to your study. So if you're using the same data and repeating the same procedures, you're really trying to verify what was originally done by the researchers. If you start switching the data around and keep the same procedures, you're starting to try to replicate and get a sense of whether what was done in one location or one time or something holds in another uh, context, essentially. And if you go formally to read like um, the recent report by the National Academies and, and several other disciplines, although different disciplines use slightly different terminology, basically this verification is what is often called uh, reproduction, although that's not what it's called in computer science. So we get hung up there sometimes, but we'll use the National Academies sort of language here. And essentially this is obtaining the same results with the same code, same um, data, things like that. And then what they call replication is usually changing the data, but keeping the procedures pretty similar. Now there are other sort of uh, components in this, even this 2 x system here. And Joe was already talking about some of the ways in which the students have started to reanalyze um, the data. So keeping the data the same, but starting to make some tweaks to the procedures, such as changing those speed limits, for instance, to see if it has an effect on sort of how those cachements are created. And similarly, kind of moving around this box facilitates the kind of this purpose of extending or moving towards generalizability by come basically coming up with new studies altogether that are sort of working around the same purpose by using different um, approaches and different data each time around. And this kind of, all this kind of relates to dimensions of not only reproducibility, a spectrum of reproducibility, but a spectrum of assessing the credibility of a result that Joe is gonna to speak to here for a few minutes. Yeah, so reproduction work or the assessment of reproducibility has typically focused on what I'd like to call computability, 
which is essentially or bitwise kind of reproduction, right? Um, where the study is computationally reproduced by study one, if the data is the same as the input data, the original data, the computation is the same as the original computation and the result is the same as the original result. And so in order to achieve this kind of reproducibility, you need to have open and available data, code, a processing environment, which might include something like CyberGISX or um, a Docker container, metadata, and open licenses and standards so that you are actually permissible to, or permitted to copy and re-execute the data. Um, next. And so we, if you think about those criteria, what you're really focused on in that form of reproducibility is just the materials and methods and the results of the paper. And you're also kind of assuming that those are correct, that if you get the same result as the original paper, that the reproduction is a success and you can move on. Um, and so you could score that on a one or zero success or no success scale, or more often we kind of are computing a score and placing a paper on a reproducibility spectrum, depending on how many components are, um, are open and are, are uh, attached to a paper in a research compendium. Uh, next. And so I think if we refocus from computability to credibility, it forces us to re-engage with the entire research paper and publication, starting with its theory and concepts, and including the discussion and results and interpretation of its findings. And so reproduction for credibility focuses on all components of the study and doesn't assume that the materials, methods, and results are correct. Um, a study must first be computable and only then can we begin to use reproduction studies to assess the credibility of a study's claims and its suitability to inform policy in future scientific studies. This form of assessment may also find a spectrum of reproducibility, but this time focusing on its credibility rather than its computability. In fact, more often than not, we have found ourselves deviating from the original computations to propose alternative methods and to improve a study. Next. Uh, so essentially you've got computed, computability and all those components we talked about before on the left-hand side. But for credibility, we also have to engage with this litany of other issues, including errors in the data or the processing, uncertainty caused by decisions that the modelers have made, um, violation potentially of assumptions of models that have been applied in the study, construct validity, inferential validity, and also the generalizability of the study. Um, next. And so when we reproduce for credibility, we start with computability in this upper left hand quadrant of the verification of trying to reproduce the study exactly. But pretty quickly, we find ourselves trends sliding over to the right into reanalysis, um, essentially adding code to the study to test for error, test for uncertainties, add tests for assumptions, and then um, adding our own intellectual work into interpretation in terms of assessing the contract validity, inferential validity, and generalizability of the study. And so why reproduce studies? You know, um, it starts with just trying to verify, but ultimately we want to be able to assess credibility. We want to be able to use reproductions to teach methods to our students. And um, we really see the reproduction and the first reproduction study as opening the doors to be able to do the reanalyses and uncertainty analyses, to be able to replicate, to be able to better inform policy, to be able to feed multiple studies into a meta-analysis and to facilitate extension, which is really, uh, I mean, the ultimate goal is better and faster knowledge production in the geographic sciences. So, Basically, um, that's kind of our approach to this whole thing. And we think it offers a number of different benefits uh, pedagogically and then also for the uh, knowledge production as Joe was saying. But to swing it back to our COVID studies, basically we kind of took this approach and applied it to six different, um, uh, six different studies of COVID-19 that were published over the last um, year or so. So we wanted to reproduce uh, these spatial analyses of COVID to assess their cred credibility, but also to teach students these spatial analytical techniques, research design, this kind of broader approach um, to research, uh, not just bound to computational reproducibility. And at the same time, we're developing infrastructure uh, 
to not only teach in the future, but also hopefully to facilitate these kinds of reproductions by other researchers in the geographical sciences. So we basically tried to tackle six different um, COVID studies to date. Um, most of these or all of these have a reproduction that's been done at this point, and we're working, moving towards reanalysis and replication of some of them. Some of them have um, small replications like the, the one that Joe presented already. Um, and generally these studies here uh, were spatial statistical analyses. Uh, they used observational data and kind of the animating question behind most of them was they were seeking to identify sort of like contextual covariates associated with either COVID incidents or COVID death, some sort of COVID outcome. Um, and just to place these studies in the context of the pandemic, um, they were mostly published in the summer and fall of last year or early into this year. And they were really analyzing data from uh, summer or earlier last year. So really your first and second wave of COVID-19 um, in the United States. And just to be really clear about what we've done here, um, these studies were not drawn based on like a probability sample. There was no sampling frame. So when we talk about these, we're not trying to make claims that are generalizable across all COVID studies. I mean, these were picked with the pedagogical purpose in mind, with CyberGISX in mind and things like this. However, I think, you know, what we've seen in these studies and the selection process we did go through when we picked these studies is that these are not that different than what we've seen in terms of geospatial analyses more broadly. However, we don't have a, a solid statistical framework to make big claims about that, but we can make sort of like, um, you know, illusions, I guess, at this point, as maybe as far as we can go. Um, so let me give you quickly our approach again, just to reiterate this and talk through some of these studies. So, you know, these six studies used a number of different methodologies. A lot of them were using different spatial pattern statistics, um, different forms of spatial econometrics, um, some Bayesian methods, things like this, but they were on the statistical end of our discipline, again, looking at that question of associations. Um, and most of them use sort of your standard computational environments. Um, they were done in R or Geoda, um, things like this. And when Joe and I and the students attempted these reproductions, we often moved them into uh, notebook uh, formats, usually in Python or R, uh, most, most frequently in R. So R reproductions were done in the original software, but then also done in these um, in these notebook environments that make it easier for others to reproduce what we've done. So just to give you a sense again of how these six, these six reproductions were done, who reproduced these studies, as we said before, uh, graduate students enrolled in a spatial statistics class with me at ASU, and undergraduate students enrolled in open GI science course with Joe at Middlebury, and then some of the students and some other students uh, pursued independent studies and, and RA shifts with us. So it was really very much student involved and student driven project in a lot of ways. Um, how do we do these? Basically, students did a, a large portion of the work here. Joe and I helped to guide them, but really as part of their lab work, as part of their RA shifts or independent studies, they took the lead on gathering the data, doing the coding, um, checking and, and, and rechecking things over and over again. And Joe and I were involved in terms of iteratively reviewing and improving the students' work and also helping them revise their approach, conceptualize things differently as it went along. And I think it's just really quickly worth emphasizing that formally, Joe and I don't have a ton of training in a lot of the sort of environments that we're working in. Joe and I each have like a uh, one of those kind of data carpentry workshops in R and Python, but that's sort of the extent of our formal training in this other than sort of self-teaching ourselves through time and I guess being willing to, to try to do so. So I only say that because I think, you know, this can be an intimidating um, uh, task for people. Uh, it looks like a lot of work, but, you know, even with some moderate experience, we were able to, to do it. So I think that's probably encouraging to anyone in the audience potentially who doesn't think they have this kind of level of experience. And if you do, maybe it looks easy to you then, which is only good as well. Um, so what do we do? Basically, our reproductions followed a multi-step process similar to the one Joe outlined before, but just to give it to you formally, um, we selected studies and COVID-19 um, really kind of focusing on our pedagogical goals and the idea of um, picking studies that we think could also potentially be scaled in terms of their methodologies. So an important part of this is, you know, the analyses that were done here may have been done regionally or with one set of cross-sectional data, but the idea in picking some of these was in, in making these analyses more reproducible and integrating them with the CyberGISX platform, you could do these same analyses with much larger data sets again and again with many form with many cross sections of data, which is really important for the policy generating process if you think about it, because you often have this iterative revision of policy and you want to update it with the most recent data. So that was part of our selection motivation as well on these. 
And basically our approach is kind of what you would imagine, which I already discussed. So in classes with students, we would essentially have the students independently dissect these studies um, and create workflow diagrams from the original uh, studies and whatever was available in terms of code and the written paper. Uh, and then we would come together and collectively make a workflow and synthesis and evaluation of each individual study and analyses. Uh, we then move forward with making a pre-analysis plan. Joe and I created a template for um, pre-analysis planning for spatial analysis research, which was an amalgam of best practices we saw from many different pre-analysis planning templates with the addition of different um, key elements that you need for spatial research that weren't highlighted or included in those. Um, and students would basically write the pre-analysis plan collaboratively using the GitHub environment in Joe's class or mine using a, a Google Docs environment. And this was really important because the pre-analysis plan links to a reporting function that we have at the end of these, where essentially the pre-analysis plan is the first half of that report. And the second half of that report is the results of the study, but also any unplanned deviations or changes that we made throughout the course of the analysis. So it's clear where we saw things were potentially not credible and how we need to change things as we went along. Um, and essentially after that, we set up our collaborative environment in GitHub, much like Joe, already uh, showed you, sometimes integrating with CyberJSX, sometimes just doing it on local environments. Uh, and then it kind of proceeded as you thought. We'd basically implement those pre-analysis plans, writing, executing, debugging code, working and kind of through it iteratively again and again. Oftentimes we'd have to program things from scratch because in most of these studies, um, code and data was not necessarily available. So we'd have to sort of figure out what was done by the authors um, working backwards, or even if code was available, there were errors sometimes or things like this that we needed to clear up. Um, and in a few cases, we did contact the authors because we kind of hit a wall that we couldn't get past without talking to them. And they were very receptive and responsive in terms of giving us data or trying to explain how things work. But for the most part, we did try to do these independently uh, without um, connecting with the authors. So there was this sort of um, independence to the checking that we were doing. Um, essentially then we, once we kind of executed each of these, we would compare the results. Again, these were mainly statistical studies. So we were looking at sort of the direction of the effects, positive or negative associations, um, the magnitude of their significance. Uh, and in some instances, we tried to do correlation between our results and their results, as Joe showed already with the prior study showing the strong correlation between um, the original results for each hexagon and the ultimate uh, outputs for each hexagon. Uh, and then at that point, we sort of had a reproduction as Joe was saying. And in the course of doing that reproduction, we often find many different uh, little threads we wanted to pull on in terms of changing the data, changing the code, uh, digging deeper into the constructs or how people operationalize different spatial concepts. So we often would try to test these things in, in the form of a reanalysis, tinkering with the code, tinkering with the data uh, to try to see if it, it had a strong effect, one decision or another on the ultimate outcome. And then we've published some of these reproduction reports as open GitHub repositories that anyone can access. And we're currently trying to figure out the best way to um, publish these results as well, sort of in the normal journal space. So we have a couple of thoughts on this, potentially putting them out as sort of research notes in the original um, in the original publishing journal with a link to our full repository while the data code is there and you can run things um, in our in the outside environment, or potentially uh, putting some of these things together into sort of a cumulative paper about um, our work on COVID-19 and the results we find. And, and those things are in progress and will be out soon, but at the moment you can already see some of these reports published on our HEGS-RR um, website. And more will be released soon as we find it finish cleaning them up so they're <laughs> consumable by the public, as you can imagine, it's always an iterative task. Um, so what are the key findings of our studies, right? Let's get to the good stuff. You guys have a good sense of how we did the pedagogy and how we did the approach, that stuff is good too. But ultimately at the end of the day, you probably wanna know about the credibility of some of these studies. So what did we really find? And there were really kind of a, a number of key takeaways we'll pull from across the six studies here. But we basically saw on the reproducibility dimension, the basic components needed to reproduce studies were often not available. Or if they were available, they were often missing important data, uh, metadata or uh, and in some instances, it seems the authors may not have closely examined the metadata for the data they ended up using in their studies. And that led to some problems in the analyses that we can give you some examples of as we go forward here. Uh, similarly here, when studying COVID, we really saw this interesting thing that like this is clearly an interdisciplinary problem, but depending on the author group for the studies, um, there seemed to be some difference in terms of how well they treated space versus how well they treated sort of the epidemiological end of the question. Um, so that was sort of a, an interesting thing that we found that clearly the studies that were able to treat both of those things well seem to give more credible findings. 
Um, we also noticed that in some of these studies, sort of the key spatial analysis decisions were really weakly justified or not carefully examined. So a lot of these studies use spatial regression, for instance, and sort of just defaulted to a Queens-based ways matrix as one example. Um, but there's a number of other examples we can touch on as we go through here. And then finally here, when you do these kind of spatial analyses, there's always kind of this background problem of potential having selective infer inferences in that one model is reported but in many cases, probably many models were run, or even in some instances, you know, like you're doing a large scale um, local Moran's eye test or something like this, you're running in this case, thousands of analyses, like tens of thousands of analyses, if you're doing the whole United States, and there's not really any adjustment made in some instances for the multiple testing that's happening. So it's not clear if the results are um, actually, actually significant or just the product of running so many tests, which is a common problem we see and spatial analyses. So we'll touch on each of these as I hand it to Joe, um, and he'll give you a little more depth about each of these key kind of draw and takeaways from these six reproductions. So Joe? Yeah, thanks, Peter. And I see that time is kind of running. So I'll just try to give a quick um, example of each of those points that you just gave. Perfect, yeah. Uh, so in the first, they're really, and this also hopefully answers Jin Wu's question, um, that there, he was asking, the presentation is very interesting. Did the five studies that replicated uh, published with the code, or were they published with the code? If not, did you find significant differences in reproducibility between articles with code and ones without code? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, there's absolutely no replacement for actually having the code. Um, even if you contact the authors and they're kind enough to share their original data with you. Um, the map on this slide is an example of that where the original authors, well, the study uses a hexagon tessellation prior to their spatial analysis. And um, the authors were kind enough to share that hexagon data with us, which is preloaded with the independent variables and dependent variable. Um, but the highlighted ones in red were, first of all, we didn't have code to generate this hexagon tessellation to begin with. And the highlighted ones in red were actually moved from their original positions after the hexagon tessellation was created. And we don't know how or why those particular points were moved on the map, but there's absolutely no way we could reproduce that from scratch, right? Um, there's also no replacement for providing the original data, particularly in this context with COVID-19, because of the temporality of it. Um, so if you could go back for a second, Peter. Oh, sorry, um, the, unfortunately, a lot of the data that's been used in these studies was pulled off of public dashboards, which are uh, reanalyzed and re-aggregated on a daily or weekly basis. And you can't necessarily go back in time and download um, the data as it was on a particular date um, for the geographic units used in the original study. Um, so it's essential uh, in those cases for the original author to share the data with you in order to be able to reproduce that. Similarly, you saw examples earlier where OpenStreetMap data changes over time. So the assumptions you've written into your code for OSM data wrangling at one point may not work for OSM data down the road. Um, in addition, authors did not provide their metadata and sometimes did not look into their own metadata well enough. The example on the right is not a COVID study. It's from a, a climate change vulnerability study in Malawi, but it uses DHS, um, the U United States aid surveys, uh, to household surveys, and those are randomly displaced by up to five kilometers. And the way that the authors spatially joined that data to other geographic units actually created a high, high probability of error for any point on that map that is not dark green. Um, and so those were easily misallocated. Um, we haven't seen a study yet that uses the margin of error provided with ACS data as just another example. Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Sure. Like just going back to the interdisciplinary problem here, this is a good example here of sort of two ways to treat uh, the key um, data, the key variable that people are looking at. So a lot of studies would kind of look at COVID cases per 100,000, which does do some normalization for population. But a better way to often treat this kind of data is with something like a relative risk that also accounts for age structure in the population and other important covariates. So um, this is one example from work that was done by one of the geospatial fellows that did actually try to address this relative risk kind of approach. And what we saw in these studies was that the teams that were kind of on the epidemiological end of the research spectrum, given that they were in public health schools or things like this, did a pretty good job on treating the epidemiological questions in terms of using age-adjusted risk rates or things like this. But they didn't then attend as well to the spatial end, 
whereas the ones that were kind of more the, the teams that were more geospatial did a better job handling the spatial relationships, but didn't give as much attention to sort of how to construct key variables, particularly the ones related to COVID. So again, this just emphasizes this idea that this is really an interdisciplinary problem and having these interdisciplinary groups is really key to um, having a credible way to approach these issues. So Joe, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, sure. And so um, there, you know, basic, all the things we learned when we're doing an introductory GIS class about boundary effects and modifiable aerial units, problem, they apply to production research too. Um, so the accessibility notebook in its original form did not contain this error, I would say that, but in a revision of the notebook to try to get the network data small enough for GitHub, uh, limited the network data to just uh, the city of Chicago, which unfortunately causes boundary effects and edge effects when you're talking about catchment areas. Um, because the hospitals just outside of the city may contribute services, the population just outside of the city may use the services inside the city, and you need the network to extend that far in order to properly include all of that data, right? Um, and the next slide is a classic example of the modifiable aerial unit problem in research, where this um, hexagon tessellation that we've seen before, uh, data was loaded into that from different geographic units, for example, um, the county statistical areas of Los Angeles County uh, were aggregated into the hexagons using the centroids. And so the only places where that um, is accurate is that the, the light yellow areas on that map. Every place else has more than 80% um, error in terms of overlap with the original um, county statistical area and the hexagon to which its data was allocated using the centroid method. Yeah, and these errors essentially propagate through the analysis because subsequently when they created the spatial weight matrices for this analysis, they ended up dropping out the hexagons that did not have populations, but those hexagons probably actually did have populations given that they were aggregated up based on centroids. And so the last kind of related problem to this is this issue of selective inference. And this is actually a good example from one of the studies we, we, we uh, reproduced. So you can see here on the furthest left, the original analysis, this was a local Moran's eye attempting to identify hot and cold spots of COVID cases. Um, and then we were able to reproduce this uh, in the middle here, but we also found that the authors did not use any sort of correction for multiple testing. So if you do do a correction for the fact that you've run about 3,200 tests on this study, um, you actually find far smaller number of COVID hotspots and cold spots in the country if you make this adjustment for multiple testing, which basically um, you know, it deals with the fact that you have so many tests being run. Um, to the author's credit, though, they did actually include a correction for multiple testing, but they only included it in the appendix. So the entire paper here is written up around the results that you see over here in the original, which um, don't account for this fact, even though they did account for the multiple testing in the appendix. So it was kind of a strange case, but illustrative of sort of this, a little bit of a misunderstanding of the best way to approach these kinds of questions. So just because we're running out of time here, I think we'll just briefly give you a sense of some of the infrastructure we've built along the way. So you've seen some of these studies that we've done, some of the key problems that we've run into. But as we've been doing this, we've been building some key infrastructural components in the background. So CyberGISX already provides a lot of the computational infrastructure we need. But what Joe and I found there was that building some additional um, repository structures was really a key value add of our project. So essentially on GitHub, and any of you can go and look at this on our Hex RR website, there is a Hex RR template which essentially creates a folder structure and has a pre-analysis plan template for anyone wanting to construct a reproduction or replication of an existing piece of geospatial research. And the key thing here is that, again, we sort of looked across many different fields, psychology, linguistics, economics, and tried to pull together best practices in terms of organizing your workflows and then uh, creating pre-analysis plans, essentially declaring what you're gonna do before you do it, and adding in some key um, spatial features and dimensions to this uh, in terms of like being very clear about your extent, uh, spatially, um, how you're doing your units of analysis to avoid these kind of law problems, and things like that. Um, and just, you know, this has many different subfolders. You guys can explore it on your, on your own, but the, you know, within these, there's sort of like data and um, code practices, things like this to try to encourage reproducibility and replicability as much as possible. And I think just really briefly, Joe has a good example on the use of the Git ignore as a way to show how this works. And then we'll kind of wrap up. Yeah, in a nutshell, when we're trying to uh, 
create computational reproducible research, we still confront challenges of very large data files or data files that have legal or confidentiality restrictions. And so we created a data structure, um, moving data from raw to derived as you work through it and starting in private folders and then transitioning over to public folders where you've got this organized structure for where to place your data at different phases of the research. And we use the git ignore feature of GitHub so that data in the private space is not version tracked or uploaded to github.com um, until it's ready for the public eye. Yeah, so essentially there's a number of next steps for us to carry forward with this. Obviously there's some computational details that some of you may find interesting, some of you may not find interesting, but we're continuing to build kind of notebooks to go with this template. So there's be a template um, computational notebook and we're working to convert the geospatial fellows, the rest of the fellows projects into this environment. We've already done it for one of the fellows projects, um, Jay Chakravorty's. And we're kind of just, again, kind of gather and communicate these things um, to everyone more generally. So just to conclude, because we've already gone too long, because of course, Joe and I always go too long. Uh, so there's some key takeaways here. Um, so our reproductions made clear uh, this need for reanalysis and sort of um, the need to kind of enhance the credibility of some of this work, right? Computational reproduction was difficult because the components needed to do it often weren't available. Um, the studies, we kind of would characterize them largely as observational and really exploratory. They're giving us a sense of some key potential directional effects here in terms of what might be associated with COVID and things like this. Um, but really until you get into finer grain analysis and start reanalyzing things or extending things, we don't know how much we can actually take away from these at this point, right? So there has some credibility here, but we think that there's enough um, questions in the code and in some of the decisions that further work is definitely definitely needed uh, at this end. Um, more broadly, we're continuing to build this reproduction-based pedagogy. You guys have, I think, seen very clearly how much we've worked with the students and how we've been trying to build infrastructure uh, and sort of the things you need to adopt this, not only in our classes, but for you to adopt in your classes or to encourage your professors to adopt it in their classes if you're a graduate student in the audience. And we're trying to move more and more towards having reproduction replication be a formal part of graduate training and undergraduate training in the geographical sciences so that we can be more effective as a discipline in, in informing policy and creating new uh, and actionable knowledge. And then finally here, I think just um, this kind of integration with CyberGIS, we think is a really strong point of this project and things that we'd like to carry forward. So presently in CyberGIS, uh, for instance, there's this uh, um, push to create communities, different sort of uh, areas within CyberGIS to work with different kinds of research, maybe hydrolysis over here, COVID research over there, things like this. And we see this as a way in which, you know, there will be, there'll be the appropriate cyber infrastructure for different places, but we still wanna see cross pollination. And we think that this kind of reproduction and replication platform that we're trying to build in terms of a repository structure and computational um, notebooks, things like this, will be sort of a cross-cutting thing that could be applied across many of these different communities and facilitate this kind of cross-pollination. So we're trying to build the infrastructure within the cyber GIS end, within the pedagogical end, and then also doing these studies to create sort of new knowledge and check um, existing knowledge, not only about COVID, but of things more generally in the geospatial sciences. So. We're well past time. I didn't mean to step on you there, Joe, but hopefully you'll let me wrap it up here and just say thank you to everyone and point you towards a few of our different resources that are available. Our um, GitHub page has these different projects and all of the infrastructure that we'll be talking about. The, um, uh, and obviously the cyber GIS infrastructure exists out there for everyone to link to, which I'm sure uh, Xiao Wen will now speak to to some degree. So thank you everyone for your time and apologies for running a little bit long. Thanks, Xiao Wen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Joanne and Peter, that was a really wonderful talk. We are running a little behind, so I'm going to be uh, cutting down my slides just to uh, build on what Peter and Joe have presented. Uh, very quickly sum up. Uh, let's see, how do I get this in the slideshow mode? All right, I see uh, Peter's thumbs up. Yeah, very quickly to um, basically acknowledge the fellows, as mentioned by Peter and Joe, we have started the program, the webinars from this past March, uh, but the fellows program is a year long. Uh, actually, uh, Peter and Joe's presentation captured the gist of the fellows program pretty nicely, but uh, again, a shout out to all the fellows. We're going to wrap up this project next month, but uh, I really enjoyed 
all the fellows webinars talk and we certainly will build on the momentum of the fellows work. Again, for newcomers to uh, the webinar, this is a very brief definition of uh, cyber GIS. And our major uh, platform getting built up through the collaboration of the fellows is this platform referenced by Peter and Joe. And the, with the link, you'll get to this page. But even more excitingly is this uh, community space uh, existing as part of this platform. And we have other community spaces, but this community space is specifically focused on the Geospatial Fellows work. And we have a number of notebooks and also um, blogs. I'll show you the next slide. If you click the link here, you will directly get to this page. And again, we're trying to uh, synthesize the notebooks, data, software, and blogs basically to lower the barriers to access the narratives and also the processes involved for uh, reproducing and uh, replicating the work behind the, the individual projects and the individual notebooks. This is the snapshot of the, the fellows blogs so far. Again, the fellows still working intensively. Now we're getting to sort of the final stage of the Geospatial Fellows Program to finalize their notebooks, finalize their blogs and connect their data and connect their code so that this is becoming holistic view into the work uh, by the individual fellows. And we're making references and creating metadata to associate the work together as uh, existing collaborative work has demonstrated, but also to foster emerging uh, interdisciplinary work. Well, the motivation for doing this is to democratize the use of advanced cyber infrastructure and the high performance computing. Uh, as we know, the technologies are evolving very rapidly and certain problems are just too complex for individual domains to tackle as, as Peter noted earlier. The next set of slides are really getting into some technical details. I would not have time to unfold the specifics. So I'm gonna quickly jump to the end here uh, to emphasize the importance of pedagogy and also the workforce uh, development and education aspects. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had this summer school conducted on the campus of uh, UIUC. That was, uh, I think, uh, quite a success. And we're committed to continuing this uh, workshop series once it's safe to return such a format. And uh, you see some uh, you know, nice pictures taken uh, a couple of years ago, and also uh, people are really excited. Uh, but I'm giving this as an example, we have a lot to be done. We're to some degree scratching the surface, both on the development of the infrastructure, because this is to scale what Peter and Joe have done to the community level, right? Uh, and Peter and Joe did a very nice job to not make this as a sort of rocket science in some aspects. So this is hopefully not as intimidating uh, as, uh, as some parts might sound, but the whole point of democratizing the use and access to uh, advanced cyber infrastructure and uh, high performance computing for geospatial discovery and innovation and education is to help the entire community to really benefit from this type of capabilities and also to address complex problems, uh, maybe by forming collaborations. And the education part, we've had some really, I think, early successful experiences and we need to build on that and really also scale this to community level. So with that, of course, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, want to thank NSF, but also uh, at the Cyber GIS Center here in Illinois, uh, we benefited from other sources of support. Uh, I leave my contact information there. Uh, that's my final slide. So I think we successfully wrapped up at 5 p.m. Central <laughs> Time. <laughs> uh, and a plus there is that Joe already addressed uh, some of the questions or some aspects of the questions from the Q&A box. Uh, as uh, if you would return from previous webinars, you know we're here to stay for a little bit longer to address any questions you might have. Uh, but uh, I wanna give another round of applause 
to Peter and Joe, and also to all the fellows who uh, presented here. And of course, AAG support all of our webinars are recorded. So uh, if you do Google search, or we could post the link, uh, July team might help to uh, get the link to the, the chat box. So you could listen to the previous webinars. Uh, again, big thanks to um, AAG. So I'll stop there and open the Zoom floor for all uh, possible questions and the feedback. So uh, 